Um, remember she was saying this morning in the keynote, there, it's not magic, it's, it's coding. Well, let's try our magic since the coding didn't work <laughs> on the website. So thank you, Ray, for, and also I've co-opted Ray to doing this with me today, so don't go far. I am right here. <laughs> and this session's called um, Blocking Bias in Micro Moments, and the origin of this session was actually at WT2 four years ago when Carolyn Samard, so Carolyn Samard is the managing director of the Stanford Innovation Lab. She and I were leading the executive women's session and we talked to them, we said, here's some of the research, here's what's happening in workplaces. What would you design if you could design anything to create change? And what they said is, our organization's doing a really good job on our formal processes, but it's those everyday interactions that are just killing us. So we, talked about this idea which we called micro-sponsorship. Instead of waiting for a formal time when you could advocate for someone, what if every day, your everyday experience was where people blocked microaggressions and really saw you for exactly what you're contributing? So this workshop is designed around that. And it's also maybe an answer to one of the questions people ask us. How do you compare being overlooked with at a meeting once to not getting a promotion. Sometimes when we talk about these microaggressions, it makes people feel like we're not taking the structural issues seriously. Or if we talk about the structural issues, then it makes us feel like we're not tending to the everyday experience of people. So what we would say is you need both. You need fixing the organizational processes, but this workshop is really designed on those micro moments. And it was inspired in part by the work that we did with um, Lean In. So this launched last week. It's called 50 Ways to, to Fight Bias. And the idea was that there are many conversations that just occur and no one has a name for what's going on. So what if they designed cards that would allow you to notice something, understand the research about why it happens, think about why it matters so you could present it, and then have a conversation. So my colleagues at the lab, Marion Cooper, Melissa Abad, w Carolyn, we contributed to seven of those cards, and that's the packet you received today. Not that all of them aren't fabulous, but we said, we can't go through 50, let's go through some of the ones that we developed and we're most familiar with. So these are for you to take if you didn't get one, raise your hand. And um, I don't know if this is child labor or one of my proudest moments, but my, <laughs> my daughter, who is a sophomore in high school, is handing out the packets. So Carlisle, um, hi. Um, you know how embarrassed they are when you take a picture and post on Facebook? This is like 10 times worse than that. So thank you for coming with me today. <laughs> Um, and so the, the really cool thing about this is that there's a complete kit available. They are selling them at cost. Um, what we noticed in some of our conversations is people, especially at WT2, have really specific questions they want to address in these conversations. Like, I've already dealt with those. I want to get into something that no one else talks about. So the design of this session is we're going to talk about what happens in conversations when you see something and you're just your flag goes up? I don't think that's right, but what do I say? Then I'm gonna just give a quick primer on the kinds of bias we're looking for, or kind of microaggressions we're looking for. We're gonna practice with the lean in cards and then the sheet on your um, seat is to actually have you start designing your own conversations and we're gonna do that together. So that's what today is, is about. Okay, so I don't know if any of you have experienced one of those moments when something happens and you know that you should speak up, but it's very hard to. And then on top of it, the burden of then receiving that conversation plus having to say it sometimes can be very weighty. Um, that happened to me once I was at a conference, a diversity and inclusion conference, and it was one of those free form tables where you go and discuss a topic. And there's no moderator, you just go talk. And the topic was workplace flexibility. And working at a research institute, we know workplace flexibility, which is often helpful for professional women, can be disadvantaging for women who work hourly. Because what flexibility can mean for an hourly woman or a man is, we don't need you today, it's time to go home. 
So flexibility is a very tough topic to talk about universally, knowing that there's a breadth of experiences people have. So as we're talking about flexibility, I work at a research institute. I'm so excited to bring this conversation to the table. But I noticed there was one person who was kind of dominating and acting like a facilitator, even though he wasn't. And I raised this idea that flexibility is not always good for workers. And he looked at me and said, that's not my experience. When people are committed, this isn't an issue. And slowly, he started to turn his back and lead a conversation to the rest of the people in the organization and not to me. And I tried, you know, all those tactics that we talk about where you take up more space and you like, I tried all of them, nothing happened. I left frustrated. So the only thing left for me to do is to complain to my friend. And she said, Lori, you're at a diversity inclusion conference. You can't just not say something. You have to speak up. I'm like, if I ever see him again, I will. That's where I got to. So I sit down at the plenary and he sits right here. So of course, I have no idea what happened in the plenary because the whole time I'm thinking, I made a promise. I made a promise to speak up. So I went up to him afterwards. There's a bunch of people around him. I went up to him afterwards and said, can I just give you some feedback on that session? He sent them all away and he looked at me. One of those moments where like, are there still people here? Because I'm so present. And I just shared, I just want to give you some feedback on how it went for me, how I experienced it. He listened so thoroughly and then the most startling thing happens, he actually cried. And he said, I had no idea. And I said, I'm so glad you responded that way because I didn't want to be the complaining person. I always want to be the strong. And I had to admit this moment of what I perceived as weakness. And he said, I'm so glad you told me. The way you told me, it wasn't like you're a bad person for doing it. You said, here's the impact on me. And then he gave me his card and he was vice chairman of a multi-billion dollar company. And I went, wow, I probably wouldn't have spoken up if I knew. I'm so glad I didn't. But that's the problem. Because he's so powerful, no one had ever told him that he enacts these behaviors that are you know, someone who's at a diversity inclusion conference who really cares about it, that he was behaving in a way that wasn't inclusive. So this is about that. We shouldn't always have the burden on us, but what would it take for us to speak up a little bit more? And then what would we say? And how would we do it? And why don't we? So that's what I want to explore with us today and hopefully get us to a place where we have some of those difficult conversations we talked about today. In Marianne's session, you talked about how these cultures are very hard to get through, so it won't work everywhere, but what if we could start to have these conversations? So that's what today is about. Um, what is a micro moment? So what I'm gonna focus on is not when, for example, you didn't get a promotion you deserve. Those are really critical junctures in our careers where disadvantages have real consequences. I'm gonna focus on what I call a micro moment. Just when, for example, you share a really great idea and everyone doesn't pick it up and then later someone else picks it up. Or you get introduced and, you know, Lori, she's so lovely, she's so fun, we're so glad she's here. And, my colleague gets introduced as a brilliant scholar, right? So how do we deal with these things where we're not sure it's big enough to bring up, yet we know if we don't, that we're gonna walk away feeling diminished in our workplaces? And how can we do micro-sponsorship on behalf of ourselves and behalf of others in our workplaces so that not only are we helping ourselves, but we're creating maybe a culture shift in what we're doing? Okay, so when you see something, if anyone's like me, this is what happens to you. I get frozen. <laughs> and I know I should, but sometimes I'm so surprised it just happened to me that I don't actually know what to say. In fact, Ray and I were discussing why I always put my middle name in my, so my married name is Mackenzie. My maiden name is Nishi Ura. That's a big conversation we had about all of that, but that's how it ended up. And I insist it's on most of my documents, not only because I'm proud to be of Japanese American descent, but because of a comment I recently received when I went to a company and someone ran up to me and said, you don't have red hair. And I had to think, why is he saying this to me? I was like, oh, because Mackenzie, he didn't know my middle name, da, da, da. he met me. So, right, so I deliberately put my middle name in. So we were having that conversation just now 
why I put it in, but I don't always have to have it said out loud because you can see me and see that I don't have red hair. <laughs> but in that moment when he said it to me, this is what I did. And later it took me a while to figure out what to say because I was so busy being surprised. And as an introvert, maybe I do need to have like a moment where I see them later and say it because I do process things a little bit more. So we often freeze. And though when we're ready to speak up, which might be for me, like for me, five minutes later, this is what we want to happen. <laughs> Kind of like with that man, we want the butterflies to start flying. He has the moment of his lifetime and we're walk away happy. But why we don't speak up is we are afraid that this is gonna happen, right? <laughs> and that has happened to me too. They're not always these great moments. And we're rightly so really worried about having a difficult conversation. Really worried like what if it doesn't, and, and partly justly so, because often then we're the ones to, who are blamed for being difficult, right? So this is, can be real, um, real challenges that we might face in our workplaces. So partly want to offer some ideas to reframe what's happening in those moments. I often feel that when I'm speaking up, it's my job to teach someone a lesson, right? I want to show you something that I've maybe learned in my experiences or through research that it's my job to tell you. And what we've seen some promising work around is if we reframe it to, from a teaching to a learning moment, which is really all that work about growth mindsets and having a learning orientation to what we do, okay, that if we move from a teaching to a learning moment, it can in some ways ease the pressure on us to do it right. Because we're there to learn about an experience versus to tell someone how, how it is. So moving from a teach, teaching to a learning orientation Okay, now researchers uh, Anita Rattan and Carol Dweck did a study to find out how often these incidents happen and what happens when people really do speak up. So they polled hundreds of people in an organization, African Americans in an organization, and asked them, how often did these things, have these things occurred for you? And there were comments like 67% um, said they had experienced it. There were comments like references to laziness references that were directly about their race in front of them, to them, and also references to criminality. So this is, here you are at work, like me with that ice cube frozen because you've just experienced one of these really negative um, comments in a workplace. What they discovered was that if a person had, so if a person had a growth mindset and they spoke up about it eventually, what happened for them was it actually shifted their perception of that person who just enacted that behavior on them. So instead of, like for, for me with the, the chairman, instead of me walking away saying, wow, there are just some really jerky people in this world, I walked away saying, wow, it didn't make it okay what happened, because I still didn't get to make my point, but maybe this isn't such a bad person after all. So, one thing we know is if it happens to you or to someone like you and someone speaks up, it can shift your perception of that person. The second thing it can do, again, it doesn't make it okay that these things happen in your workplace, but it can actually increase your workplace satisfaction. So to reframe it from, if you speak it, it's only for the person you're speaking up to, but thinking that there might be some benefits for you as well in enhancing kind of how much you respect and think positively about your colleagues and can increase your workplace satisfaction. So this is kind of some of my motivation to speak up more often than I have been in the past. And um, we often talk about the fact that we absorb stereotypes. So if you think about the stereotypes that many women need to be likable, we absorb that. So it's even harder maybe to bring these up. As an Asian, maybe there's the model minority stereotype, which is even harder to bring things up, right? So some of my friends who have um, maybe LGBTQ friends said they have an angry woman stereotype around them, so it's even harder to speak up because they activate it more. So there are many dimensions through which this could be um, feel uncomfortable, but what I think, what's been helping me is to think about if I do this, maybe this shifts my desire to stay and work in an organization and, and be an advocate for change. Okay, any questions about that? Is that speaking up uh, for yourself 
for speaking up when you witness or observe something else being treated? This study was done for speaking up on behalf of having received it. Okay. I imagine as well that if I spoke up on behalf of somebody, <laughs> it could help with these two as well. Yes, please, Liz. Does this study uh, look at um, instances of, um, of like backlash against the person who is speaking up against the bias or is speaking no, so this study looked at what happened to their perceptions, so it was done in psychology, and, and you're right. I think one of the challenges, as you know, having been a DNI professional in this space, is that the perception of, if I'm expected to be liked and agreeable, and I speak up, and we do have a, a difficult outcome, there is the chance that I would be per the one who's per being perceived as difficult, right? And what I've discovered is that just for myself, I'm often perceived if I'm in a role talking about DNI as the person who is contrary to a lot of the culture that's going on. And when I see something like this, it actually diminishes me a little bit if I don't speak up. That's just my personal experience because I think I could have said something and I didn't. So I think what we're just offering is a framework to balance for those who want to speak up and are equipped to speak up what might support speaking up in our commitment to the organizations that we care so much about. And we can talk about backlash as well. If someone wants to talk about what you would do in a situation where instead of it going well, it's that negative outcome, and then what would we do in that situation? We, we could talk about that, absolutely. Okay. So what I thought we'd do is we'd speed practice. And what I mean by that is we would go through one of the cards, but I just want to start with a few tips. Some things we know that help conversations go be better. One is to meet people where they are. So oftentimes, if we've been on this journey for a while and we've seen more things, we might be talking to someone who's experiencing this for the very first time. So when we meet people where they are versus criticizing them for not being as far as they are in the journey with us, it can help a conversation go better. So for example, some people will say, I have never experienced bias. I don't think it exists in my workplace. How do you have a conversation with someone who really in their experience hasn't experienced it? We found we get farther when we meet people where they are. When, um, there's a great article by Amy Gallo on having what we would call cri these critical conversations where there could be some perceived conflict. Um, she talks about perhaps just a little bit give up the need to be liked. And I find the more I've been examining this, the more this influences me more than many other things, many other considerations. So what would I give up instead of needing to be liked? Um, and some other tips about how to assume good intents. We talked about enacting psychological safety so we can have these debates, but I still like you. I love these ideas. Um, one is to always give the benefit of a doubt. So if someone says something, right, how can we give that person the benefit of doubt? Maybe they haven't experienced bias. What about not equating their disagreement with me as unkindness? Oftentimes when I'm saying I'm advocating for fairness or equity and someone disagrees with me, them, I, I have this negative assumption of who they are. What if I gave that up, that they are necessarily unkind? And then uh, Katie Orenstein, who founded the Op-Ed Project, um, we worked a lot with the Op-Ed Project is trying to get more women advocates published in the media. Um, she says in her training, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? So I think about that a lot. Am I just trying to be right? about my point or be effective in these difficult conversations. Um, any comments or questions about these? Anyone have anything else to add about what works in having these critical conversations? Yes, please. Um, there's a great line which is, why would a reasonable, intelligent, like good-hearted person do this or that thing? Yeah. So try to first imagine yes. what they might, kind of like get to know where they're at, kind of imagine different possibilities and interpretation. Absolutely. So um, someone in our family is libertarian and probably one of the most generous, socially responsible person that you will meet. But the minute he says he's libertarian, people shut him down because we have these perceptions of what someone like that is versus saying, 
look at this person, this family, look at the roles this person does, let me hear what this person has to say versus assuming things about them. That's really great. What would a reasonable, kind person say? Oh, connection request. I don't Sorry, know. I yeah. Think, um, yes, please. Lisa Gilbert's comment this morning about listening with all your senses may be a useful frame when you're entering such a conversation, right? To truly listen with the intention to try to hear the other person, even as you have the difficult conversation. Right. So often our sensors are going, other senses are, are playing into this conversation. And are we listening with them or is this kind of, maybe this is ruling, ruling the day? Yes, please. So another one of the things that I think about when, when I have one of these conversations or I hear something is that if I said the thing that I've just heard, it would only be because I was a bad person. Mm. Because I know not to say that. Yeah. But the other person, it's not necessarily because they're a bad person. They just... They don't have to be a bad person. They could have a whole different thing on their mind. So it's, I, I don't know how to say it there. Yeah. yeah, no, that's perfectly said. So again, and, and to give yourself the benefit of doubt, sometimes I have accidentally said things that have been off-putting. So I grew up in Cupertino, and even though right now it's about 50 to 60% Asian when I grew up, it wasn't. So for me, being around community is super important where I live. And I lived for a year in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it was a very different experience where race meant you're black or you're white and Asians were a real anomaly and I had to explain things like I don't eat with chopsticks every day and I shop at the same store you shop at and I eat spaghetti for dinner like it was always this thing so for me there it was a lot of burden to have these conversations a lot just a lot so one day I was talking to someone and they said oh you lived in Cincinnati I said oh yeah I survived only a year there not realizing that this person was from Cincinnati <laughs> so i said it myself. So to have some compassion that sometimes these things come out. I'm just thinking of one myself. Yes. <laughs> and as a frequent visitor of Kentucky myself, which I love the Lexington people, I worked for a lot of people, but I said something about, oh God, yeah, Kentucky and like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how do we have these conversations to move us forward? Yes, Liz? Um, uh, do you have any uh, author insight about Having the, these difficult conversations um, in the moment or moment adjacent um, in, in a group setting versus individual. Like in your example, you ended up having that conversation with that man at the conference in, on an individual basis. But you know, had you called it out in the moment, it would have been in, in this group. Do you have any thoughts? Or it's, that's where I think diagnosis is really critical. So how well do you know the person? How much freedom do you have to spend time on it? There's no actually right or wrong answer to it. I think it's um, putting more experience in your belt. I think uh, one thing Marianne said the last time she's had the, a certain question so many times, by now there's a way she knows to answer it that's both helpful mm -hmm. and you know really moves people forward. The first time I've answered some questions, they haven't gone well. Mm -hmm. and. You know, what I've done is then I haven't given up and I keep trying. So I think what we learn over time is what works with us, the group we're in, and having those conversations. And just as an introvert, sometimes it really takes me a minute to process what just happened. So if you ask me to speak up, that might be different than another person speaking up immediately, right? Um, what I've learned to do in the moment is more what Joan Williams calls gender judo. So instead of addressing it head on, so there's many ways you can address it. One is head on, like I did, did you know what happened, like the effect your actions just had on me. Others are gender judo, where you move the conversation away from a negative outcome. So if someone's being interrupted all the time, I could try, you are interrupting her all the time. I could try a joke. Gee, is this the interruption game? Or I could move the conversation away and say, oh, before we move on, I love this train of thought. Let's continue it before we move on. So in the moment, I'm more comfortable with the latter, which is addressing it through a way to stop it from happening, but not talking about the behavior. That's just what works for me, and I've learned over time. Others, I think especially people with more of a sense of humor than I have, can address it immediately in a way that moves people and doesn't make people get defensive. I'm not as good at humor as some people are, so I don't find that works for me. 
So I think it's being comfortable with your own skin and how you address things. Understanding power dynamics. So if you remember the masculinity contest of the last one, if you're then attacking someone's sense of power and status in the moment, will that spiral downhill, right? So what I think it's just getting some diagnosis over time. And giving yourself some freedom. Um, I was telling someone that I did a, a, an interview and I said a really stupid thing. And, and I was really upset. I just needed to talk to someone to like process it. And she's like, get over yourself. You think the world revolves about everything that falls out of your mouth? It doesn't. I bet no one noticed. And I was like, <laughs> but then I thought she's right. I bet no one even heard that. And all the, you know, so I think there's a degree to which we put so much weight on these moments and maybe no one's really listening that much. So if we make a mistake, we can weigh it. There's many smart things I've said that have gone unheard. So maybe, right, maybe we have some freedom around this conversation. And, and I, I'm not saying we should always speak up. We just get asked to like, what? Like, it's a huge issue. How do you have these conversations? So we wanted to create a template to have them and have us learn together how to have more of these conversations. Okay. So just to remember a little bit about how we're going to talk about bias in those micro moments. Um, what often happens is that bias turns out to be an error in assessing talent, which means I'm hearing you, but I'm discounting what you're saying because I'm making an error in how valuable your contribution is, right? So you can imagine the chairperson not realizing that I'm not talking from personal experience about part-time work. I'm talking about from research studies that we've done. So we often misassess who is a contributor, who has value, and then we end up acting in ways that aren't consistent with how we really could respect and honor someone in a conversation. So why it happens um, is that we're often just make categorizing people and stereotypes about people start to act as those cognitive shortcuts. So if we want to say, whose opinion should we listen to in this conversation? We're sorting to how much value to give to people's opinion in the moment. And stereotypes about people do start to act as some of the shortcuts. And the easiest way to see it is all the way people are valued or undervalued based on some studies. This is just a short overview. There's some really great other resources I can point to you to as well. But for example, just seeing that as a student, a man was part of a gay pride organization while in college is enough for a resume to be seen as lower value. So it's, it's as little as that. In this one, um, they added a line to a resume saying um, that the, the person was an officer in a parent teacher association, so PTA that was undervalued. And in this one, they took the exact same picture. Um, and in, in Germany, you can add a picture with your, your resume. And in one, they put a German name under the picture and one, a Turkish name under the resume and one with a, a headscarf and a Turkish name. And that was the least likely to be called in. So in all these situations, someone's presenting their expertise and a little trigger makes someone undervalue them. And that's what we're talking about. And how does that play out in conversations? Okay. One, people are being held to a higher bar. Prove it again. So prove it again. It might be, here's the code I produced. Here's the paper I produced. Here's the presentation I produced. That's really not good enough. You need to come back with something again. So that the way in conversations it can play out is having to constantly bring new evidence that you're, you're competent in your work. These are the things that we're going to start looking for, hearing, and blocking in conversations could be doubted. Really? Really? So I might say, oh, I, I know we all read the resume and it's really great, but I talked to one of the references. And even though this work experience seems soft, when I talked to the reference, they explained how extraordinary this is. And the response I get is, really? I doubt it. Right? So mm -hmm. that kind of conversation you start to hear, wow, why was I doubted? I spoke to the reference. So that kind of doubt or extra scrutiny. She can code, but can she convince me? So these are the kinds of things, if you start hearing in conversations, these are the things that we're gonna try to block. So we're gonna look for a higher bar in conversations. We're gonna look for what we would call microaggressions, so being interrupted continually, right? I can never get a word in edgewise. Being overlooked, I present an idea and it's silent. I, I raised my hand 10 times to try to go to this conference and I never get picked right, being overlooked, and 
things as much as racial slurs like, oh, you don't have red hair, right? Um, I'm going to talk about intersectionality just briefly. And what I'm going to say is sometimes our groups ignore people who are included. So for example, in, this, in a situation where there's race and gender, what if a black woman goes to um, a women's group and they say, well, why aren't you in the black employee resource group? So ignoring someone's intersectionality. Um, or if we're talking about parental status and veterans, Say, you know, so let's say a veteran brings up parental status, we say, well, we're not talking about parental status here, being a parent, although that's part of the experience of someone. So in some of our spaces, when we're talking about, you know, groups that might be gathering for a particular orientation, a status characters, identity, accidentally leaving out someone who wants to talk about different aspects of themselves accidentally. And then the last one is we often see criticism of communication style, this like ability penalty, someone being told you have sharp elbows, even though you just presented like everyone else did, or that being criticized. So again, if I walk around like this, um, I'm more likely to get, oh, is something wrong? Are you okay? Right? Because I'm often perceived as being very enthusiastic and supportive. Right? And um, in one research study, we um, were observing, um, they were calibrating a man and he was tall because they said he's so tall but he never speaks up what's wrong with him he's such a gentle giant so there are ways that we as, as Mary Ann called it gender police people are criticized people for behaving in ways that don't really adhere to the stereotypes we have about them. so can we start catching a higher bar leaving out someone's inner part of their intersectionality criticizing their communication style and could we speak up in those moments all right so to practice, we have, you can open your packets, and if it's hard, there's a pen, so you can stick the pen in and open the packet. These eight cards. And if you look at the side with the largest type, those are kind of the scenarios. And what I thought we'd do is to sit with a partner, or three, and pick one that you'd kind of like to work on. I did this before, what we found, I'd like to practice having the conversation, but most people just wind up talking about it. So what I think we'll do is we'll spend three minutes with your partner just discussing the situation. So Ray and I are gonna role play. Which card are you picking, Ray? This one, right? Okay, so do you wanna read it to Terry Yes. Moore? You're on a review committee and several members argue against a woman's promotion because she is not seen as a leader, even though her team delivers outstanding results. Okay, so in this first three minutes, what we do is say, have you ever seen this happen? And um, what happened? Does it happen only in promotion meetings? And then I would say, well, in my workplace, this is how it works and what the constraints are and da-da. So spend maybe, let's spend three minutes first just discussing the situation. Have you ever seen it? So first pick one with your partner. I guess first pick a partner, introduce yourselves, say hello pick a card, and spend three minutes talking about it. So um, does anyone want to share? Are you surprised that you could both talk about the same scenario? Or did you have, it was like, oh. So who would like to share a little bit about your discussion? It's the end of discussion already. That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> Stop my timer. Anyone else? OK, so we'll get on then. So Ray and I are going to role play. So Ray, do you want to? Tell me a little bit about your scenario. Yeah, so um, in this scenario, obviously there was new criteria that was introduced for this uh, for this woman who's up for promotion. And basically they said she's not seen as a leader. I haven't actually gone through situations where we're evaluating promotions, but I've been in multiple organizations where we're looking at selecting candidates. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this same thing occur for women and uh, minority candidates where new criteria is introduced Whereas one person, they weren't even looking at this, but then it's like, okay, we have a woman. And so, oh, they're not really, I don't really see this as a leadership quality or seem like that. So it's an introduction, an introduction of these kind of performance biases. Um, and partly I've seen it mostly when the process isn't structured. So when it's not structured, there's opportunities for people to introduce these new criteria. Great. So now we're gonna role play, oh, okay. having the conversation. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be the person who's introducing the new criteria, and then you'll be the per Do you want to do it that way? Yeah, and then you'll be, OK, good. 
So um, we are observing these candidates, and we have you're proposing this young woman, and I say, oh, but she didn't go to Stanford. And as you know, referrals are an important part of our recruiting strategy. So she won't be able to refer the kinds of people that we hire here. So I don't think we can accept her. Okay, so in real life, how is it? Been like crying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but put my acting on, and I'm gonna use this card as a solution. So, um, I, can you justify that thinking around that with the criteria that you introduced? Because I really think that we we didn't say this about other candidates. Why why in this particular case is that critical? I thought we said that about other candidates. No, this is the first time that I'm hearing it. Oh, so can you really? Can elaborate on that. <laughs> so surprised are you but I thought that was part of our recruiting strategy um it hasn't been formally outlined and so maybe in the future if this is extremely important a long time a long-term solution is creating a detailed metrics driven plan <laughs> that's very specific <laughs> okay then what do we do um I think that in this case I'm very adamant that we move forward with this particular person okay Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Okay. So what what I would like you to do is each pick one person to be Ray, one person to be me, one person who sees this microaggression, one person who's enacting the microaggression, and practice either what's on the card. So as Ray said, there's tips or something else, and then we'll talk about feedback afterwards. So three minutes. Okay, three minutes. So who would like to, sh anyone like to share what it was like actually practicing these words? Anybody? I heard a lot of great conversations. Any please. It's always great if you take the Yes. Yes, it is actually fun to play the wrong side of the conversation, right? And hear how someone will respond. So I, I took tips on what Ray said. Anyone else like to? Share. Okay. So what we're going to do next is design our own conversations. Now, oh yes, please. Um, I have a question for you. One of the things that maybe as part of being an ally or a scholar, say the right thing at the right time. Is like you're trying to get somebody to think in a much more unique, systemic way because like these are all mental shortcuts. Like anything with any is a mental shortcut. And I'm just imagining the scenario that we're talking about with like performance, talking about performance, it's like, they're like, oh, hey, well, why don't we look at our list? Uh, like, here's all of the qualities that we're looking for in a person, and let's re re decide what words we're going to use for each person. Like, that's very, it feels very like process heavy, which I think is the right thing to do. But what I'm saying is, you know, especially if it's like, you know, right after lunch and somebody's in a slump, right? Like, you know, <laughs> and if there's all these physiological that make it difficult to influence somebody in this way to get them to go more deep. And I'm curious, like, do you have any thoughts on, you know, if you're saying before meeting them where they're at, but also how to help guide them? These are a lot of skills, I think, a lot of these that are on here. Yeah, so, and, and also, you can hear that the long term solution is to fix these processes. Right, so ideally you'd have a clear list of criteria. You will have aligned on it. You'll have evaluated the candidates only for those criteria. And when people stray, you can reference that good process and block it. So that's really the long-term solution. And this is more designed to say, what do you do when it happens? And I have seen people in a conversation. Now it's not to say, maybe that person will have revolution, but it was very hard for me to argue against Ray because I didn't say that about anyone else, and we were going to have it. So the more we align our processes, these conversations will remind people of those good processes that we're doing versus being a brand new idea no one's ever heard of, right? And the more we talk about this, the more it'll become part of our process that our job isn't to pat ourselves on the back for our meritocracy. Our job is to debug where our meritocracy is broken and work together to fix it. So that's the culture shift part of that makes it easy. Now, what I've learned in, from people who've done this effectively or moments when I've done it myself is sometimes those comments are enough. Sometimes they're enough to let people pause and sometimes they're enough to let people go back and reconsider a longer process. So 
what I think we're working towards is can we normalize these kinds of conversations in our culture by starting to have them even though they won't all turn a big light bulb on. One woman we know was in a conversation for promotion and they said, we just can't hire her, she's high maintenance. And the person paused and said, what was high maintenance about her? And they said, she negotiated her offer like crazy. And the person said, how did you ne negotiate your offer? And realized that negotiation is normal for an executive. So it doesn't always turn out that way, but in that moment, speaking up in that moment, not talking about the process, that person reconsidered what they just said. So I think that's the short term what, we, what could happen, right? What could happen is someone could say, wow, we're really bad at interviewing. Next time we better do these things. But I'm too much in a hurry, we're still gonna hire this person. Like there's a many outcomes. I think that stops us is, for me, like I'm such an idealist that I want only the really good ones. Sometimes we're on a journey together and we're going to get there together. And this is one of those points on the journey that I hope will lead to people valuing criteria and good process. And I have seen it shift, doesn't always, but imagine what if this was the time you did and one person got hired who wasn't going to. That, that makes me want to try. Yes, please. Sorry, you have a cotton pole that needs to speak. So I would have noticed that everybody's mm -hmm. so, we'd really love to do that, but we don't have time. Mm -hmm. We only focus a lot of time. Is there any cotton in that? So how do you handle that situation? That's what these are for, is for us to design the conversations that are not on the lean in card. So nice segue. So, when was the speed need for speed? Was that review? Was that in everyday interactions hiring? When, when did that happen? So pick one. Pick one. Okay. So so that so if you notice, there's a little box you can check reviews and promotion. Now describe your issue, which for you would be oh, write it down. I I told them we should clarify criteria. They said nope. We have to hurry. Someone else is gonna steal our top candidate, and if we don't act, we're gonna be screwed. There's only one unicorn, and we're gonna lose the unicorn. Okay, so that's, right? So now why it happens, you could say for you, it's likely um, debugging meritocracy. That, that really are why it matters. You need to come up with processes that get you the best people, not the most expediently gotten people. Right? So that's what, why it matters to you that you fight for this moment. You can pick your own, but that's the one I was guessing from it. And then consider um, uh, why it happens, okay? Or why it, oh, I did the wrong slide. Okay, why it happens. So why would somebody say, Trump, all your good work with need for speed? Why would they do that? Is it because that person is being held to a lower bar and they just want to get them through? Is that why they're using that excuse with you? Is it that they're just trying to shut you down? Is it because they refuse to look at the complexity of the person that's being considered and they're just like, whatever, just need for speed? Or is it that anyone who's not speaking like this, they just can't deal with it? Oh my God, she asked so many questions. I'm babysitting her, get over it. So in your particular situation, which of these feels like the reason why you got that objection? And there's many more I just put together based on kind of easy ways, to, easy, maybe easy buckets to think about it. Was there one that you thought, that's probably what's going on? Okay. We just cannot deal with you talking about a complete person. I want one data point. Yep, and did they go to get an elite degree? I always think it's funny, people are like, there's no pipeline. I'm like, do you know there's only 400 people who graduated from Harvard Business School, but you all want eight of them? Yeah. <laughs> right, so great. So I can't consider the whole person. I've got 30 minutes. I'm just going with what my gut says. My gut says they have to speak like me. Done, I don't have time for the rest. So the question would be then to, to then say, what could you say? Now, does it, I want to crowdsource, what could you say to the need for speed? 
given that it's about reviews and promotions, the person refuses to look at the whole person and kind of criticizes you for being slow. And the flip side of need yeah. to speed, right? Ugh, stay with me. This is a contest for like speed, right? You can hear that. So what, does anyone have an idea of what you could say? Carolyn. Actually, it's not a good example. <laughs> we want all examples. It is only because I was, a, I was an outsider and um, we were working with an organization in clarifying process for promotions and clarifying criteria. And at some point, one executive said, well, you know, I, we just need to go faster. It sounds like this is going to involve more process and this is going to be like slower and we can't afford that and everything. And then I, I just told the person, I think I was, I, I went from frozen to just like, that's it. And I said, okay, if you don't want to thoroughly invest in the work to evaluate talent fairly and take the time to do it right, that's fine. But then don't make promotion and salary decision. <laughs> <laughs> Because your active decision you're making speedily is impacting these people's entire lives and careers. Um, Can you hear the range of what's effective? Right. So that was a little bold, but it definitely, you know, very, very quickly was like, oh, yeah, you're right. It makes sense to invest in this. We care about talent, right? So it was, <laughs> it was hard to then be, to, but if I had been this person's employee, I'm pretty sure I would have been fired. So. It's only because of the external being being there specifically to provide this kind of input. So also she worked at the medical school, highly, highly competitive, not wanting to seem like you're not considering all the data and the, the rational way you should do things. So understand your audience and what can pull them in. I think you did very effectively as well. And then take, sometimes you do take a risk. So, you know, so it's also a risk not to speak up because then you're stuck working with a situation that is bad as well. So there's risks on both sides of the equation. Anyone else have an idea? Please. I feel like this may be part of like the TA and HR side of me, but reframing it, you know what it would cost and the time it would take if this person leaves the company because they don't get promoted or you promote the wrong person. And then just kind of putting that into perspective and not all about just the right here and right now, but what the future impact could be in that decision. I love that. So you're explaining the cost of a quick decision versus the benefit of a fast decision and showing the weightiness of the other side, right? So do you think these, does that help? Okay, so um, what this card is designed for you to do, so you are free to have these cards to take with you and, wait, I have. A few opening statements that I've been told are effective. Um, again, thinking about gender judo, often starting with a question invites someone in if you're authentically waiting for someone to answer the question. If you ask a question and you really don't care what the answer is, it's really not a, a question. So, <laughs> right, so some, sometimes um, talking about, do you mind if I give you some feedback? Most people won't say I mind, right? Can I share some of our team norms with you? So talk about not your ideas of what works, but the team's ideas of what work, right? Oftentimes talking about how it made you feel instead of what they did can help. So just some um, opening statements that can help. Um, I was gonna have you practice. Um, and, and there's another great article Amy wrote about how you can kind of de-escalate some of those emotions because sometimes they do get out of control, right? So one thing is to, you can focus on your breath. If you stopped breathing, maybe that's a sign that you need to take a moment to tend to your emotions. Um, focus on your body. So it turns out if you actually move, it can help alleviate some of that tension you're feeling. So if you notice you're like this, fight or flight, you can actually get up and sit somewhere else on the table for a minute, take a different perspective. Um, try singing a mantra. I loved this one. I had to read what it meant by this. So sometimes my mantra is, this is what's good for the organization. This is the workplace I want to work in. This is the world I want to see. So sometimes that mantra can de-escalate some of your um, 
emotions and take a break. So there, it, especially for someone who hasn't worked out your whole idea of what you're going to say, maybe you just take a break. Okay. So um, you can read more about our research here at womensleadership.stanford.edu. You can order the complete kit of the cards. It comes with lots of useful ways to start this. I have people who've come up to me and said I ordered them and let a circle on this just based on it. So they're really designed. They have free ones you can download and use digitally only. You can buy a set yourself. Um, on our website, there's also videos you can watch together on blocking bias. If you're not sure what you're solving for, there's things on our website. Um, and hopefully you can fill this up and eventually give us more ways to incorporate your ideas into future iterations of what we do. So th then the last minute, I just want to ask Ray if you'd come back up here. <laughs> yes. So in that conversation when you were acting a role, actually you look at the audience and I'll look this way. Okay. Um, even though you said you're not an actor and there was so what we're doing is trying to create new conversational habits. Like maybe we've never ever said before, oh, and we have someone from Lean In here. Go ahead, finish it. Yeah. We've never developed these conversational habits. We're trying to develop them. So Ray, even though you were acting, the card was given to you. Can you, and you don't, I'm not expecting a certain answer. Okay. Like, did it actually open something up for you and what you might say? Yeah. Um, so I think that in, in putting my, myself in that situation, um, I could actually potentially think of solutions and it made it less threatening than if I was actually in the real situation. Because I think that, like I said, the frozen piece, I can totally identify that because there's been situations where I've seen things happen and I'm like, oh man, I should have said this. And then afterwards it's kind of that. But I think during this scenario, it made me think of, hey, the criteria thing. Um, I, I've, I've presented that recently in, in a circumstance where we said, hey, we need to have consistent criteria, but that's the IO psychologist in me, so I can default to that that's as okay. being a bias, uh, but it is something that's necessary. So this was very helpful, um, but yes. Thank you, and then would you like to, I'd oh, like to introduce awesome. Arcana, so thank you. Thank uh -huh. you, Ray, let's give him a, thank you. Would you, so Arcana works at Lean In, she's the Director of Partnerships, and would you like to share anything about yeah, in our no, last few minutes? It was great. It was, um, for me, it was just really fun. I was someone who's interacting with the cards a lot to see kind of like the energy in the room and just the discussions in the room. Um, this summer, we are looking for a handful of companies to pilot this with. So if you would like someone from Lean In to come and facilitate a session, we'd be more than happy to do that. I'll, I'll be here for a few minutes and I'll have my cards. So we'd love to talk to anybody or be connected with anyone in your organization uh, to see about doing, uh, doing a pilot. Great, thank you. So thank you and looking forward to hearing how it goes. So thank you very much. Thank you.